I'm here this morning with Alan Middleman. He is uh, Aaron Rabinowitz and Simon H. Rifkind Professor of Jewish Philosophy at Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And uh, Alan, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, glad to have you here. Thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here, thanks. Um, so we're here at the Yale Center for uh, Faith and Culture for a uh, brief two-day conversation about the future of theology and um, uh, so grateful that you can be a part of our conversation. We're um, thinking, obviously, here at a Christian uh, divinity school and a Christian uh, theological research center. Um, but some of the questions, many of the questions that we're asking um, about uh, theology have parallels, and I'll let you speak to them to what extent they are and are not parallels in the um, world of Jewish philosophy, Jewish theology. Um, really appreciate your, your, your insight from your perspective. So as you look at it from your particular vantage point, um, what's, we'll have time to talk about what maybe is challenging in theology these days, challenging about doing theology these days, mm -hmm. but um, what's going particularly well right now? What's, what's right with theology these days? What do we have to be grateful for uh, at the moment? Well, from my uh, very particular, perhaps parochial uh, location, uh, things are looking up. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that uh, a number of uh, promising younger persons uh, in the Jewish world uh, think that the time is right to uh, express themselves in a rigorous philosophical, normative, and constructive way. Mm. Uh, this has not always been the case. I would say at my own institution, the Jewish Theological Seminary, we had one of the uh, greatest Jewish theologians of the 20th century, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, who uh, taught there uh, long before I arrived. But uh, I think everyone knows Heschel and the, the kind of work that he did. His writing, I think, was basically a, a leisure time activity. That is, this is not what he taught at the Jewish mm -hmm. Theological Seminary. He taught medieval texts. Mm -hmm. And the standard uh, of what was expected in an academic setting was basically history of ideas. Uh, it was, uh, as the Germans say, Wissenschaft. It was uh, the um, uh, kind of uh, academic uh, his, his history, uh, thinking about uh, historical texts in their context. So, the uh, department that I entered at uh, JTS, the Department of Jewish Philosophy, was basically the history of Jewish thinking in a philosophical key. It wasn't as if we were contributing anything constructive in the present. Uh, indeed, my own training was in intellectual history in uh, German Jewish thought. But I felt a couple of decades ago that I had something to say in a constructive vein. Mm -hmm. And um, I found a few like-minded people who feel the same way. So there are a few of us who are doing something that you could call, I would say, constructive Jewish philosophy more than theology. But uh, I think there are many, many more people who are willing to do this nowadays, who think it's legitimate to do this. Uh, and who are, uh, are being trained in, in, in philosophy and mm. theology uh, at good universities like this one. I just had breakfast with a former student who's working in philosophy of religion here. He happens to be an Orthodox rabbi. Um, so I'm feeling pretty bullish on the future of uh, rigorous Jewish religious mm. thought that's nourished by philosophy. Mm. Whether we should call that Jewish theology, I'm not too sure. And if you'd like, I, I'll say something about the, sure. the distinction. Uh, I teach a course called Contemporary Jewish Philosophy and Theology. Uh, the idea behind the course, I originally had a grant to do it, was that I could bring working figures from these fields to campus and we'd read their work and then they'd have a seminar uh, with my students. But 
one semester was uh, what we're calling contemporary Jewish philosophy, and the next semester was contemporary Jewish theology. So I had to come up with some plausible working distinction between these, these two terms. And uh, I do think Jews are more comfortable with the idea of a Jewish philosophy. They think of Maimonides, let's say, mm. as a Jewish philosopher mm. rather than a theologian. I think because the term theology comes very much from the uh, Western Christian context that Jews uh, have lived in, continue to live in. So there is a little bit of a fraught uh, uh, kind of connotation about the term. And nonetheless, I think it's a perfectly good term and it's usable. And I tried to use it in my course to parse certain thinkers as theologians and other thinkers as uh, philosophers. So my distinction, which might be completely idiosyncratic, uh, is this, that if uh, a Jewish writer looks to uh, a canon of philosophical literature as his or her sort of uh, interlocutor, basis, audience, that person is a Jewish philosopher. So someone like me who's very concerned to talk with Kant, talk with contemporary neuro-philosophers, evolutionary theorists. I think that's philosophy. If I look for what makes a cogent argument to logicians, to moral philosophers, I think I'm doing Jewish philosophy. Mm -hmm. If someone is um, more concerned to stay within a kind of canonical Jewish literature, like mysticism, Kabbalah, or Hasidism, or some of the medieval pietists, uh, and to reflect on those in a contemporary, educated, academic kind of way, primarily for a Jewish audience in service of the religious life of the Jewish people, I would say that's Jewish theology. So one of the books that I assigned for the Jewish theology semester was actually a set of lectures given here, the Franz Rosenzweig lectures at Yale, by a colleague, Professor Arthur Green, mm. formerly of UPenn, of uh, Brandeis, and uh, for some years now the head of a rabbinical seminary in the Boston area. And Art is talking about God and the Jewish people and ethics and nature, mm. but he's drawing from in-house Jewish source, sources mm. from kind of spiritual mm. and ethical literature that's, uh, that's out there. It's not, I don't think he would call it philosophy and I wouldn't call it philosophy either. So, but it certainly is intellectual. It's conceptually rigorous within mm. its own idiom. So I wouldn't want to carve this distinction in stone, but I think as a sort of working mm. uh, rule to put some folks in one category and some folks in others, it's, it's, it's good enough. Mm. Mm. I would also say then that a Jewish thinker who draws heavily from Christian theology uh, is probably a Jewish theologian. So just mm. recently, uh, a friend of mine who is an exemplary, a very provocative thinker, Michael Vishagrad, mm. passed away. Vishagrad was a professor of continental philosophy, Heidegger especially, but in his theological work, he drew from Barth. He was inspired by Barth. So a continentally oriented philosopher writing about the Bible under the aegis of a Barthian perspective, I think that's theology, mm. but. Mm. So Rosenzweig was a theologian then? Yeah, I would say. Um, but others wouldn't. I mean, mm. Rosenzweig was trained as a scholar of Hegel. Mm. So that already puts him in an interesting place. And he repudiates Hegel in some very fundamental way in The Star of Redemption, but he also appropriates Hegel. 
in some very fundamental way. And we're coming to see more and more how systematic his masterwork, The Star of Redemption, is. So does that kind of rigorous intellectual systematicity suggest more of a philosophical bent than mm -hmm. a theological bent? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the extent the term has, the distinction has validity, it, it may well break down in someone like mm -hmm. Rosenzweig. Mm -hmm. But I don't think Rosenzweig does that a contemporary philosopher would look for is run an argument. Mm -hmm. In a sense, the whole opus is an argument, but if you're a philosopher looking for arguments that are good ones or bad ones, you, you don't know what to do with something like mm -hmm. Rosenzweig. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of like Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. you know, but is Nietzsche a philosopher? I, yeah, we think so. Right. All right, so we, we started at least there with, uh, with what's going well <laughs> in, okay. in, in theology and in, in Jewish philosophy. Um, is there anything that give us, to give us pause, uh, anything that sh we should be worried about, anything uh, going wrong uh, from in your particular location, institutional concerns or concerns about the direction of the field or kind of work taken up? Uh, I, because, you know, there, there are um, many fewer Jews in the United States than Christians, and the Jewish population is not growing, and it's unclear uh, to what extent anyone beyond a slightly widening circle of intellectuals is interested in this kind of thing at all. So I just don't know about the audience for what I think is um, provocative, well-done Jewish philosophy and Jewish theology. I, I think when you go to a Barnes and Noble or something like this and you look in the religion section, you know, you know the kinds of things you see there. It's a, it's a lot of um, self-help stuff. It's a lot of diffuse spirituality. The quotient of academic theology in uh, the popular bookstore is pretty low. Uh, I think it's true in the Jewish world as well. I think that mm -hmm. there's not a big market for the mm -hmm. kind of work that I'm thinking of. I, uh, uh, about 20 or so years ago, a, a friend and colleague of mine who teaches at the uh, University of Chicago Divinity School wrote, uh, he gave a lecture at Oxford. It was called uh, Jewish Philosophy and Obituary. Uh, and he talked about the, the trends in the U.S., in Israel, that militate against the kind of deep uh, intellectual, moral, spiritual engagement mm. that produces good religious philosophy mm. or, or theology. So about 10 years ago, I was invited to organize a conference at Princeton, which I call the Renaissance of Jewish Philosophy in America. Mm. And I picked up you know, some of these folks who are doing this kind of work. And we had very good audience participation. We had a couple of hundred people. Uh, it was a good event. So uh, I was able to put it together as a little book, and I invited the scholar at Chicago, Paul Mendesflor, to write an afterword to it to see whether there was enough here to push back on his diagnosis mm -hmm. from uh, a couple of decades ago that Jewish philosophy deserves an obituary. And he said, uh, he said, the Germans have an expression that's a blend of ja, yes, and nein, no, jein. <laughs> so, <laughs> That was, that was his diagnosis. And one of the things he pointed to is a sort of small uh, circle of people who are interested in these things. Yeah. But, you know, it was true in the Middle Ages when uh, hmm. Jewish philosophy arguably hit its heyday. And it was true in Weimar Germany, hmm. which was the other high point where Franz Rosenzweig, and we just mentioned, hmm. said that his great book, The Star of Redemption, was uh, basically a coffee table book. It sat on... <laughs> people's coffee tables in their <laughs> Berlin apartments, uh, you know, as an elegant, chic, intellectually dazzling thing to have, but not to read. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this gets to uh, a question I, I want to ask you, which is, 
So to set some context, uh, we, Miroslav and I circulated a text for our conversation in which we, among other things, propose, what if we, what if we see uh, Christian theology and various sorts of theologies or philosophies, secular philosophies as well, um, defending and articulating, first of all, articulating and then advocating for uh, we call contending particular universals, uh, universalisms. So, um, but more or less the heart of those would be visions of, of, of a flourishing human life. Um, and what if we see society as a whole, first of all, the, the university itself, and then society as a whole as a kind of uh, a place of contention among our, our pluralistic context, means that we have contention among various different um, kind of uh, traditions and philosophies kinds of ways of uh, articulating kind of what it is to live a meaningful, flourishing, good life. Um, and he said, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't this give a place for Christian theology, for Jewish philosophy, for, for all kinds of normative, for maybe a revived Aristotelian uh, mm -hmm. philosophy, which is there are people interested in virtue ethics and these sorts of things. So what if, would, would, would that work? Could we, could we have a sort of uh, public discourse that was engaged, again, uh, intellectually in these kinds of normative questions that are deeply existentially important for all of us. Um, and if I read you right in your response, you said something like, would that that were the case? <laughs> mm -hmm. But you expressed some, some skepticism, um, uh, or uh, you, know, you weren't sure that you could muster the hope that in fact our public discourse could, could rise to the sort of level that uh, that we're hoping. Have I, have I read you right? And, and what, if I have, yes. what's the cause of that kind of concern or hesitancy for you? Um, I, I mean, I, I think our public discourse about important things in the society is simply debased. I know I felt this way long before the current uh, electoral season. Uh, and I'm afraid that the university has not uh, proven itself immune to the trends that debase the quality of discourse in mm -hmm. the culture. I'm all in favor of a Jeffersonian kind of university that is in service to the nation, mm -hmm. uh, that is a school for citizenship and leadership, and that sees uh, higher learning as having uh, taken place in a context of responsibility for the world. So I'm, I don't uh, think of the university necessarily as an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that the university has uh, a, a proper ivory tower or monastic kind mm -hmm. of heritage. That is, mm -hmm. I don't think it should just be the tail wagged by the social dog. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think universities have to be places for uh, uh, rigorous but imaginative uh, conversation mm -hmm. that um, do not take place in the society. I'm not sure how much from the university can properly mm -hmm. carry over into the yeah. society. Um, so I, I, I'm not very optimistic about the, the future of the university as a, a, as a place for this work either. I, I think Alistair McIntyre basically got it right in the opening paragraphs of After Virtue that we've become technologically educated barbarians to, mm -hmm. a, to a certain extent. Um, but I, I, I do find myself very attracted to the idea that the normative question of what the, the prime ethical question of what constitutes a good life for human beings should be uh, compelling for us. That's what we should be talking about. And it has this tremendous potential of um, bridging traditions and disciplines and really serving as a, as a focal point. You, uh, you invoke a uh, kind of Jeffersonian vision um, in at least certain inheritances of that vision, and I think pretty much central to that vision itself is this kind of understanding of the university as a secular sort of space, though, and, in, and secular in a, a sort of neutral sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I take it that what, um, 
what you just mentioned and certainly what we're trying to advocate for would be much more, uh, w wouldn't be, would be the sort of space of contention of particularities rather than a presumed kind of um, uh, universal secular neutrality, right, that we can all at least put on for the sake of our conversation. Is that the, do you, is that the kind of role that you would see for Jewish philosophy in a larger university, or is that exclusively for, for the, for the Jewish seminary? Does the, does the, do, the that, do you understand the question? How do we get no. our, our particular claims from within our particular traditions into the broader uh, university conversation? Is the university the right place for that? Yeah, most of the, the um, constructive Jewish philosophers I know uh, are working in secular universities like um, Toronto and Vanderbilt and um, um, uh, Yale, uh, uh, Columbia. So I would like to see the secular university be a place where the particularism of uh, a philosophically articulated Jewish point of view has uh, has a role to play. Um, but I'm not quite sure what the deep justification for that is mm -hmm. other than, you know, viva la différence. I, I mean, mm -hmm. if you grant the notion of a particular universalism, it seems to me you've already ceded a lot of territory to an epistemology that may be at odds with the deepest claims that you want to huh. make. Um, so one thing I, I think we want to avoid is just postmodernism. Uh, but postmodernism is, is a kind of skepticism. And I, I, I think what's fueling your suggestion is also a kind of skepticism, mm -hmm. too. I mean, why are we reduced? to the idea of a particular universalism rather than a robust mm. universalism. It's not just because I think we want to be politically correct, um, good pluralists. It's because we have um, really uh, uh, sort of uh, trimmed our sails to what we think can be known. Mm. Uh, and we make uh, assertions that we think are plausible, even compelling, but we know that there's a lot of legitimate doubt that attend them at the same time. So we've basically taken the inherent moderate skeptical stance of modern science. That mm. is, we'll go with our hypothesis uh, as far as we can go and get as much out of it as we can until we falsify it and then improve on it with a new one, mm. always under the star of uh, the potential or uh, future falsifiability of our views, does that not in some sense uh, contradict the most basic assertions about uh, our faith mm. that our faith would have us make? Mm. We, is that just an academic pose or have we taken this deep into our own uh, epistemologies? Mm. Uh, I don't know, but what concerns me is if this were the 1950s and the secular alternative were some sort of Sartrean existentialism or Camus or something like that, where you know, we've got nihilism and self-creation and absurdity and meaninglessness, um, religion is attractive in the face of that. But as I read the academic mm. scene today, leading philosophers, some leading scientists, they're not nihilists, they're not absurdists, they're not relativists. They have universal, genuinely universal visions of a good life mm -hmm. about which they yeah. don't want to hedge their bets. And I just wonder in a university mm. setting, which is still very beholden, properly so, to the ideals of experimental science, what does a religious-based view have to offer that can be defended mm. by the criteria that uh, universities insist on mm -hmm. as epistemically kosher criteria. Mm -hmm. so. And why should we be uh, modest, modestly self-aware about our own particularity when the research scientists have have no such modesty? Right, They're, we're all universalists, <laughs> or we're all we're all we're all saying that we're making universal claims, 
uh, but uh, I see that. But if only the religious voices are, are the ones recognizing their own particularity, then there's a, yeah. E.O. Wilson is not modest about right. this particularity. Yeah. Yeah, I know. From the study of ants, much follows, I guess. <laughs> it is astonishing what he comes to at the uh, end of social conquest of the, of the earth. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot one can learn, apparently. Um, well, Alan, I thank you so much for the conversation, and of course, You're look welcome. forward to more of it over the next couple of days. Thank you for being here.